Hello, it's Scott Manley here. As you may have heard by now, Virgin's attempt to launch a rocket into space unfortunately failed. The engine ignited and then shut down after a few seconds. And I have on good authority that following that, there was a whole bunch of fuel being dumped as the rocket descended towards the Pacific Ocean. But the most important news is that Cosmic Girl and her crew uh, were fine and they returned successfully to Mojave. Virgin Orbit already have future rockets under construction, so uh, as soon as those are ready, they could attempt another launch, but I, I think it's more likely that they spend a lot of time investigating what exactly went wrong. And right now, we in the public have very little to go on. We have one official photo of the rocket post-deployment with the engine running before things went wrong, and the only other images that I've seen online was, uh, well, it was a, a radio operator who tapped into a webcam belonging to the Santa Barbara Amateur Radio Club on Santa Cruz Island. And it, it had a few pixels showing that something was happening in the sky at the right place and the right time to be this, but uh, really doesn't offer any clues. Now, what we can tell is the total flight time from release to flight termination system activation was probably about 10 seconds or thereabouts. So, according to the timeline that was released, we see that the drop happens three seconds later, PST activates, and I'll tell you what that is in a second. Then the main engine activates at five seconds, and we are told by the internet that the engine operated for several seconds. Now, several seconds, that's more than a couple, more than a few, less than a lot. I'm going to say about four seconds. So, that would activate it then lost thrust and at that point the autonomous flight termination system would activate and the debris would fall to the ground and the debris was actually picked up on weather radar so that's another observation that we've got from a third party so pst is probably the propellant settling thruster the virgin orbit rocket is a liquid fueled rocket and that means that it has to deal with fuel moving around in the tanks as it's flying initially it's on its side and then when it's dropped into free fall the fuel will redistribute itself for a couple of seconds when the engine fires you want to be pulling liquid from that tank and not gas bubbles because a gas bubble moving through your engine system at high speed can literally rattle pieces apart it can be very damaging so the solution is to have a small thruster to settle the propellant towards the bottom of the tanks. You'll also see this in, uh, you know, rockets that are in zero G in space. You'll have the oolage burns, which are very small thrusters that, again, make sure the propellant sits at the bottom of the tank. The other air-launched Orbital class rocket is Pegasus, and it uses solid rocket motors, so it doesn't have to deal with the propellant flowing around because, well, the propellant is solid. So, you know, while Pegasus has demonstrated one successful air-launched orbital rocket configuration, Launcher 1 is completely different and has its own set of technological ta challenges to solve, and I'm sure we will see them continue to fly this. I mean, legally, it is kind of beholden upon them. I don't think any investor would expect them to stop flying after one failure. And Virgin Orbit were always very careful to set expectations. I think they actually said that just lighting the engine would be considered a success. As it stands, this is the first US-built rocket failure since, tw uh, or in-flight failure since 2017 when the first launch of the Electron rocket failed. And you know, if you really want to go you know, full-on USA, USA, uh, you could say that Electron was actually technically a New Zealand launched rocket. So going even further back to 2015, that would be the super stripey failure that would be the last time a US-flown rocket failed. And that's, of course, ignoring the 2016 explosion of a SpaceX rocket on the pad because it wasn't in flight at the time, although the payload did fly technically for a couple of seconds as it fell back to the pad. And, you know, Air Launch does have a long history of failed programs, going right back to the 1950s, I believe. The earliest example I can see of an air-launched orbital rocket was something called Project Pilot that was developed at the U.S. Naval Ordnance Test Station, China Lake. That was going to be called you know, Project Pilot. It was going to be launched from an F-4D Sky Ray. And in fact, it was going to be flying pretty much in the same space that Virgin Orbit used for uh, Monday's test. So the rocket would have like five solid rocket stages and it was supposed to put a very small satellite into orbit. They performed 10 launches. 
During development, some of them exploded on the, t the launch pad, some of them exploded in the air, some of them lost signal. But on August 22nd, 1958, a, the, the launch happened and it fired up its engine, disappeared into the sky and they lost signal during the second stage. But cameras did show it disappearing off across the horizon and there were reports that they got signals from the payload in Christchurch, New Zealand, indicating that it had completed a pretty large part of an orbit. Now, this could be the lightest spacecraft to get ever put into orbit, but it certainly didn't last long enough to get confirmed. But at the same time, that project got cancelled and it was replaced by Caleb, which was also potentially going to be an anti-satellite weapon. However, it never really got into orbital tests because the Air Force started complaining that they should have complete you know, rights to this. And yeah, it never, never made a proper orbital test. And just this week, uh, this image came to light, which you know, implies that somebody had the bright idea of trying to hang a French Diamant rocket underneath a British Vulcan bomber, in which would be, well, what would be a fascinating example of Anglo-French cooperation had it progressed to any level of you know, testing. Now, if we fast forward to the 1980s, Orbital Sciences Corporation decides to start developing a, an air launch system called Pegasus. They use their own money. This is the first example I can find of a privately developed orbital capable launch system. They did use NASA assets, but they reimbursed NASA for them. Uh, its first launch would be in 1990. And from then it's carried out about 44 launches, most of them with the larger Pegasus XL. The first stage has, there's all solid rocket motors, the first stage doesn't have any thrust vectoring, instead it uses a wing to pull itself up from underneath the launch vehicle. This is a problem with air launch that you're going sideways and you really want to be going up early on. The wing was famously designed by Burt Rutan at Scaled Composites. So yeah, this has flown right up until last year. It launched the Icon spacecraft for NASA. However, it's really sort of reached the end of its life. While Northrop Grumman, who now own Orbital Sciences, while they have a couple of boosters sitting around waiting for a customer, it doesn't seem that any customers are interested in flying with them now. They're seen as being sort of expensive and their mass limits aren't that much better than cheaper uh, alternatives. So the one thing that did seem to be in their ballpark was a mission called IXPE, which was going to be a NASA spacecraft that had to orbit over the equator. Normally you could only get there by having an air launch because you have to have your launch site sitting on the equator. But uh, apparently SpaceX managed to underbid the uh, Northrop Grumman and therefore SpaceX are performing the launch with um, an extra dogleg turn at the equator. In the late 1980s, when Pegasus began development, the Soviet Union was still a thing and they had their own plan for an air-launched orbital vehicle. It was called the MAX, uh, M-A-K-S, and it would launch off the back of an AN-225. It would have a small spacecraft with a very large fuel tank. And one of the interesting things about this design was the engines were apparently tri-propellant. That is, they were basically engines that could work with either kerosene and oxygen for the early boost phase and then switch over to hydrogen and oxygen for later in flight to get higher efficiency. That's a fascinating concept, but as of right now, obviously it never lasted beyond the end of the Soviet Union, although I've heard rumors that keep people keep on talking about bringing back the idea. And in the last decade, we've had a few projects. The DARPA had the Airborne Launch Assist Space Access Program, which ran for about five years from 2011 to you know, 2015. They were planning to launch 100 kilogram satellites from an F-15. Strato Launch started in 2011 and they managed to build the largest aircraft in the world. Unfortunately, they never managed to get a rocket for it. Their initial uh, deal was going to be with SpaceX to create a version of the Falcon 9 adapted to launch off an aircraft, but eventually Elon you know, decided that there was not enough commonality between his orbital, his regular ground-based launch vehicle and the air launch, launch vehicle, that it wasn't worth SpaceX's time. And so, yeah, uh, Strato Launch was left without a launch vehicle. And so so right now, they are talking about being a launch platform for hypersonic test vehicles. We'll see where that goes. 
And finally, earlier this year, Robert Cringely announced something called Eldorado Space, which plans to use F-104 Starfighters as their carrier aircraft. He claims that they can carry a one-ton booster into a Mach 2 climb and release at about 70,000 feet. From there, that should be able to put a 12 kilogram satellite into low Earth orbit for about a million dollars apiece. Now, I don't know about how far this is, whether they're looking for investors, whether they have aircraft, but uh, it does sound like a fascinating thing. I'd love to see it work. After all, the F-104 Starfighter is basically a plane that wants to be a rocket. So air launching rockets is one of those obvious ideas which uh, has a long history and ha indeed has a long history of people realizing it's a bit more difficult than they thought. I hope Virgin Orbit gets their problems solved and we get another launch soon. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Mm -hmm.